So, there's a sanitation crisis. Uh, I have some big numbers. Uh, these are the numbers that I live with every day. Uh, 2.4 billion people in the world don't have a decent toilet at home. The excreta, which is a posh word for your poo, uh, of about 4.5 billion people goes into the environment completely unsafely, without any treatment or protection. And you can probably imagine that those numbers have quite a big health effect. We estimate that about 482,000 excess deaths a year are attributable to inadequate water supply, sanitation and hygiene. That includes 1,000 children under the age of five who die every day because they don't have decent sanitation. We're not making very fast progress, we're making some progress, but some countries are going backwards. It's not always a question of not enough money. Sometimes it's that money gets spent on the wrong things. Toilets which are in the wrong place. Toilets which are not or could not possibly be properly maintained. Infrastructure that's not been connected to anything. Sanitation is something that economists call a public good. That means that the benefits of individual action accrue to the whole of society, a bit like vaccination. So if I put my excreta in the environment, it doesn't make me sick, it's going to make all of you sick. And economists know that public goods suffer from underinvestment because of lower accountability. Usually the investment is not enough and it's done badly. Let's have a look at what this means in practice. Here is a photograph taken out of the window flying into Accra, Ghana, a few years ago. Uh, and you might be able to see a big brown plume going out into the ocean. That is untreated human waste. It extends about three kilometers out into the sea. Where does that come from? So it comes from thousands and thousands of toilets in Accra which are not connected to the sewer network. They're emptied by trucks and tankers, and the trucks and tankers drive up to the beach to a place called Lavender Hill, and they dump the waste on the beach. The city of Accra, at the same time, is investing in sanitation. Very close to this place is a wastewater treatment plant. It's been built, rebuilt, repaired, and rebuilt again several times. The truck drivers don't go there because it's the wrong kind of treatment plant. They know that if they go to that treatment plant, they can't deliver their waste, which looks like this. That treatment plant's designed to take waste from sewers, which don't exist. So the truck drivers drive straight past and dump their waste on the beach. Why does that happen? I think that one of the problems that we have in development generally, and certainly in sanitation, is that people find it much easier to build a new piece of equipment or have a new project than to try and solve complicated problems that involve lots of people who have different opinions and different views. A few years ago, some colleagues and myself, that's me and Andy Peel, who's somewhere in the room, and uh, Isabel Blackett, Peter Hawkins, and Chris Haymans, we decided to try and do something about this by getting people to talk about sanitation in a different way. We wanted to get people to talk about the real problem, and we wanted to do it in a way that enabled non-technical people to join the conversation. Now, if you do sanitation properly, if you do a really detailed sanitation plan, you have to write a very, very long report, usually, with lots and lots and lots of calculations in it, and that's very important, but you won't be surprised to hear that that doesn't do very much to change anyone's minds about anything. So we decided to simplify. We decided to draw a picture for any given city of where all the waste comes from and where all the waste goes. And we decided to try and have a single headline number that captured the scale of the problem in any given city. And just to make sure that people really understood what we were talking about, we decided to no longer use the euphemistic words we always used, excreta, human waste, and we called our picture the shit flow diagram. <laughs> now, we took our shit flow diagram to a technical conference, and we weren't really expecting people to be that interested, but we were really surprised. People loved it. People started talking about it. Um, people started criticizing it and telling us that we could have done it better, which is always a good sign, particularly if you're an academic. And uh, it took off. It was kind of a phenomenon. It was very exciting. It was like a collective aha moment. So what does a shipflow diagram look like? Well, I thought I would take you, first of all, to a typical British town, 
And what better town to choose than Macclesfield? This is the ship flow diagram for Macclesfield. So it's very simple. Green is good, red is bad. And the ship flows from left to right. So at the top is a big green arrow. That's all of you who have sewers. So you flush your toilet, the waste goes down into a pipe, goes through town, flows through the sewers where it says transport, and it goes to the treatment plant at Presbury. Now in Britain, Typically, and certainly in Macclesfield, we have what are called combined sewers, which carry the sewage from your house and also rainwater in heavy rainfall events. And if the rainfall is really, really heavy, our systems are designed to bypass the treatment plant. So we always get a little bit of leakage of waste into the rivers in stormy, in, in very rainy weather. At the bottom, you can see a smaller arrow, which is the people in rural districts who have septic tanks. Pretty much everything's going fine in Macclesfield. So we wanted to know, can we use this method in a city where things aren't going so well? This is the ship flow diagram for Dhaka in Bangladesh, capital city of Bangladesh. Headline figure, 97% of the shit in Dhaka, Bangladesh, is not safely managed. It's in the environment, exposing where the people are. There are 14 million people who live in Dhaka. This represents 3,000, about 3,500 tons of human shit, rather more than we'd need to fill this room, in the environment every day. What we can see from this diagram is that years and years of international investment in sanitation, particularly sewerage, has had no effect at all. We can see at the left-hand end, lots of people have broken and damaged toilets, which fill up and overflow. We can see that in the neighborhood, people are emptying their toilets, tipping the waste into the drainage. We can see that waste that gets into the sewers gets out of the sewers almost immediately and back into the environment. And we can also see that if any waste reaches the place where the treatment plant should be, there's no treatment plant. This is not a great sign. We took this picture to see uh, the key sort of decision makers in Dhaka. We were a bit worried. It's always quite nerve wracking showing people pictures like this. Uh, we went into the room. The mayor looked extremely grim. Uh, we were quite worried. We thought we'd maybe get a bit carpeted, you know. And he said, uh, OK, this is not OK. I, I don't like this 3% number at all. I'm not happy with this. I don't believe anything gets safely managed in this town. Can't you just make that zero? <laughs> and we thought, fantastic, actually, fantastic. We're having a conversation with the political leader of the city about the fact that there's the real problem. So shit flow diagrams work best if you get the right people in the room. Usually what we do is that we get as many stakeholders as we can together, and we make a first cut of the shit flow diagram, the best estimate we can make. And if it works, people then go away and start collecting better information and finding out what's really going on. This is important because we, we have a problem in our sector. We call them zombie statistics. Uh, wherever you go, you find information that everybody thinks is true, but nobody can quite remember who first said it. So we really need to deal with that problem. One of the big problems with zombie statistics is that a lot of people don't get counted. Specifically, the people who don't have legal land tenure, the people who live in slums, the people who live on the streets. But it turns out that even if you don't have legal land tenure, you still have to have a crap every day, and your crap still goes in the environment. So if we want that crap on our picture, we need those people or their advocates in the room. And here's a nice story. This is uh, colleagues of mine from Nairobi. They curated a very long process, went on for more than a year, bringing stakeholders into the room to talk about the situation in Nairobi. And they have created an entirely new narrative about the sanitation situation in Nairobi. Uh, this is them at their press release. Uh, the, the story got picked up in the press straight away, and there was an immediate response from city authorities. In India, there are more than 150 cities who have developed ship flow diagrams with support from the Centre for Science and Environment and SEPT University. Uh, and on the back of those, they're developing um, sanitation investment plans and starting to think about how to change people's lives. And here's Bill Gates talking about the scale of the sanitation problem in China using a ship flow diagram. I mean, he's actually in China, if you get my meaning. So he's talking to a lot of people. Action happens in Taka, in Nairobi, in Dar es Salaam, 
the story's changing. There's a new conversation. There are new investment plans. The people who have septic tanks and pit latrines are being taken into account. And you might be quite pleased to know, particularly if you're going on holiday to West Africa anytime soon, that dumping of human waste at Lavender Hill finally ended in 2016. So what do I take from all of this? The ship flow diagram is not a particularly complex or sciencey tool. Um, I think what it really is, is a vehicle for two things, communication and real collaboration. The ship flow diagram is sufficiently detailed to be credible for technical people, but simple enough for a politician to understand. It evinces an almost, a kind of emotional, almost visceral response sometimes, fury, horror, whatever it might be. And it works on both levels. And in terms of collaboration, what we've learned is that if you get the right people in the room, you can do something really important, which is to name the actual problem you're trying to solve. I think too often in politics and in development, we're trying to solve the wrong problem. So whatever you do in your daily lives, I'm not expecting everybody to become a public health engineer or stand around talking about shit, although I think you all should talk about shit a bit more than you do. Um, just remember, if you want to solve a problem, name the problem and name the right problem. Thank you.